everybody and their mother can pretty much show what their comedy is online, whether it's a YouTube shout-out or a YouTube video that they shoot themselves or whether it's them shooting at one of the thousand little coffee shops that are around the country and everything. So I imagine that the whole Internet explosion has also helped the comedy market as well. Absolutely, and and in a lot of cases it's helped people uh, work their way around the traditional gatekeepers. You know, the gatekeepers were always the club owners, and uh, if they thought you were funny, you might be on stage. But, you know, there's a whole lot of comics, and a lot of them are finding uh, YouTube as a way to get around um, the traditional path. A a good example of that is a fellow named Trey Crowder out of Knoxville. Um, he's done the, the series of um, liberal redneck videos, and uh, he's gotten a national platform from doing them, from the following he's gotten from uh, doing those videos. So yes, yeah, it's it's a, it's a great tool and it's a great way to kind of sidestep the the uh, traditional path. And you know, also, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just going to say with all the open mics. Uh, there's a lot of room for people to uh, do the work, brush up, establish themselves, and then get seen. If you're doing a good job at mics, people ask you to do showcases. And if you're get it, doing a good job at showcases, people ask you to do shows. And sooner or later, you'll end up headlighting as long as you keep working on your material, building it up. Because, I mean, you're right, because just the whole popularity of the Internet has been amazing. I was actually picking up a copy of an ad magazine. I think it might have been Ad Age or something like that. But they were talking about an eight-year-old uh, who's, I think his name is Ryan. But Ryan basically has got, like, some ridiculous amount of million dollars of millions of followers and, like, has made some ridiculous amount of money. I want to say it might be in the tens of millions of dollars, might even be in the two hundreds of millions of dollars. But he's made this money basically just reviewing toys. So he's an eight-year-old that they – that sits there and tinkers with toys and he's made a killing for basically his parents because we know he's not spending all of his money but uh, and that's all he's doing is going around and reviewing the toys and I don't think there are any complex toys because he's 8 year old so I'm thinking they're probably like they definitely mentioned in the article Play-Doh and I'm thinking it's like basic board games so I don't think that he's going to be running around doing like um, Mortal Kombat yeah I heard a story on NPR about him it's really a, a terrific story um you know, just a child that's able to get that kind of attention. I'm actually exactly. shooting a video on Friday uh, for YouTube for exactly the reason we're talking about. I'm wanting to find something that hopefully will get some attention and help people uh, help bypass some of the uh, traditional booking systems. Now, both of you have all talked about the gatekeepers. How much of an issue is that? Because, like I said, you mentioned the gatekeepers. Monet, you kind of danced around it, as has the other gentleman as well. But definitely, as we know that the gatekeepers are oftentimes people in power and that they are oftentimes only going to allow a certain amount of people to slip through the cracks for the national scene. But it does seem like there's a whole movement of people that are like, I'm not going to even put up with the gatekeepers. I'm going to do things my own way and, you know, create my own audience and not necessarily worry about trying to make a living on Warner Brothers or um, one of the other major film houses. Anybody? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think, think I can. I'm um, so please, money. After you. <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, absolutely. <laughs> I think, <laughs> you know, and there is something about like gatekeeping and the ways that the internet has disrupted that in a lot of ways, um, especially through like Instagram or Vine. You know, there is a young woman who I just named Jess Hilarious, who's a comedian from Baltimore. And she just like put up videos on Instagram, and then she's in the TV show with you know Lil Rel and Sinbad. So and like she just did that off of her own, like being funny, being consistent, connecting with the folks who commented on her page, you know. And there was like yeah. when you do the work, you can. I think we're in this moment that's really interesting because you can work around the gatekeepers in ways that yeah. before you needed money or influence or access in a very different way. But now, if you have a camera phone, and if you create good content, and you, or if you go viral, and if you keep doing it, you can make a whole world out of that. Um, Issa Rae is one of my, like, she just inspires me so much, because in 2012, she was making very low-budget videos from her MacBook, 
and you know, now she's working for HBO and has a movie and has all these things in the works. So I, I really feel like the industry is being just wasn't prepared for what that would mean. Yeah, and I this is Benjamin. I, I just wanna that, that's also a very interesting topic. I think you, Monet, because what I realize, especially in LA right now, I mean, everyone is talking about Hollywood and. You know, and, and, and how and it comes across so big and stuff like that. But I realized that it's actually quite a small community. So uh, just to give you an example, I mean, what happened with me is, uh, like in the two years, I, I had the opportunity to work on a National Geographic documentary, for example, uh, with some high-level people. And the interesting thing is, the reason why that happened is, is because someone remembered me that I met at an event or something, and we just started talking, and I didn't even know who he was. And I just introduced myself, and I just said where I was from, and I said, obviously, that I'm German and speak the language. You know, that's my selling point, obviously. So I always mention that as often as I can. And the funny thing is that this guy remembered me down the line and basically gave me a call and said, hey, we are basically shooting this National Geographic uh, story here in a couple of weeks. Are you available? So he was not really the gatekeeper of, of, of the whole show, but he basically was the right person, the kind of middleman to a connection who was responsible for this production. So, um, and that was really interesting to me. So you never know who you're going to meet. So I think you always have to be awake. You always have to be aware of, like, who you could meet every day. And uh, on the other side, I also have to say, because we're talking about social media, YouTube and Instagram, you can still see that also in Hollywood. I mean, when we have some, some breakdowns online and, you know, I got submitted by management or something, some production companies definitely ask, even in the breakdown, how many followers every actor has. So it is definitely a point today, which is kind of like, you know, it's, it's a little sad, to be honest, to me. If you ask me, like, as an artist, I, I see the point from a business perspective, but from an art perspective, it's a little sad, to me, if that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, all of you, what is the most interesting experience that you've had as an artist? Because I imagine that all of you have had something that really caught you off guard that you were not expecting to happen to you as an artist. Some of you have alluded to some of them, but I was just wondering if you could share some special moments that were happened to you as artists. And uh, we'll go backwards this time. So we'll start with Benjamin first and then go to um, Monet and then we'll come back to art. Yeah, so that, like, like my, my greatest moment you mean, that I had right. so far? Yeah, yes. okay. That's actually, yeah, I know that exactly. So that was basically, I don't know if you guys heard about it. This movie is coming out in 2019 that had a little bit of a delay, but it's called The Current War. Uh, which is a movie about George Westinghouse and Edison back in the day, it's like 1920s or something. And um, I basically got cast for this movie, like it was a secretary role. And the biggest moment basically for me was also working with Michael Shannon, like like next to Michael Shannon, which was a great experience for me because he's such on a like on such high level. The way how he's acting, the way how he's basically in his role, he's a, he's a method actor, right? You can tell he's on set. I was, you know, I was close to him. We had that one little scene, and I was trying to get kind of a conversation going, right? But he was so into it that he was basically talking to no one, right? And that was basically something that showed me, wow, he's, he's so into it. He really takes it seriously, and I really admire that, you know? He's not just out there but because of the fame or wants to be a celebrity. He really loves what he's doing, and that was basically my greatest moment. So check out the Q&A ball, guys. <laughs> cool. And Monet, if you're still there, I know you just got on Facebook that you said you might have to roll off, but if you're still there, what was one of your greatest moments? Yeah, so I can say my greatest moment, and I can uh, debate at all. Um, so my greatest moment as an artist, I think, was in December. Um, so for the third piece of the trilogy, we part of it was we had a night of gratitude dinner, and we had a free community dinner at the Durham Hotel, and about 50, 60 folks all ages, races, um, my mom, my dad, my brother were there, my love was there, like my friends, my family, like it was just, I looked around this room and it was just filled with people from all aspects of my life and some folks I didn't know and we purposely um, pureed the food and got produce and meat from local black farmers and some of the farmers were in the, bed, were in the room and enjoying the food as well, all of our kids were black women, this the chef leading, the, leading it was a black woman, um, and then all those, I had all some of my men friends, my male friends, who 
um, be the servers and to do that labor. And I looked around, and it was just, it was glorious. It was just so, like, sumptuous, and it was exactly the type of art I want to be curating, where the art is just us being together and knowing the importance of that and the holiness of that and the value of our presence. And the food was delicious and abundant, and it was just a really good night. So I think that has been my favorite. And I got to wear my grandma's apron. My grandma passed away in the 17th, and I was, like, stealing her also. And I got to make her bread recipe for all these cooks. I made, like, 120 rolls um, and rolled them by hand and everything. And it was just, it, it was theater in the best way. It was art in the best way. And what about you, Art? But I think um, probably one of the biggest moments personally that wasn't an on-stage moment. Um, I'm I'm a, somewhere between 30 and 20 and 30 years older than most of the comics I perform with, and you know sometimes you you worry about do I have something relevant to say or or am I going to be um, as funny as these folks who are plugged into the current zeitgeist and. Um, um, usually I do pretty well, but uh, I I was sitting in a um, car dealership waiting for uh, my car to be repaired recently, and two different people from two different circles within about a half hour of each other just sent me private messages and just told me how much they appreciated uh, both what I do on stage and what I do off stage, the support I give for other comics, and that meant an awful lot. That was a big moment for me. Oh, well, wow. And all of you, what message would you give to people that are not necessarily supporting the arts, whether that's people in federal government, whether that's people in local government, whether that's people that are on the um, regional level? Because we know that they're not sometimes people that are those that are out there that don't want to support the arts because they feel that it's um, super- superfluous and that it's not important. So what message would you give to those that you feel are not given the support and the funding to the arts? Yeah. So, seriously, what I'm always saying is that if you've never been to a play, for example, if you've never been to a theater and just see people live on stage doing a play, just go there. Even if you don't think it's something for you, just go there and just sit down and watch the show. Maybe pick a topic that you maybe a little bit of interest in to you and just watch the show and see these people perform. And I'm pretty sure that will change your mind. I think people also have to experience themselves, first of all, what it could do for them, and then also basically going the next step and maybe hopefully supporting other people in doing the art if they're not really into it, like doing it themselves. So I believe as soon as you realize that yourself, how great art is, I mean, it's really about the feeling that it gives you, right? It's not, we're not talking about the money and the business and all that kind of stuff. I'm really talking about the feeling that it gives you because for me personally, being on stage and giving a play and reaching people and really sending them a message and they basically feel something that they can relate to that, they can identify with that scene or the character, it's a beautiful thing because you basically have something that you can, that you can give to people and basically hopefully make it a better day for them or do something for them that they might think about in a beautiful way. And that's really a strong message here to me. And if people never experience that, it's really hard to judge these things. So I think I'm really advising everyone, go out and see a play. You can see plays everywhere, right? You don't have to be in L.A. or New York in the big cities. You can go anywhere, mid, Midwest, in the South. You can have plays everywhere. Just try it out yourself, and trust me, it does something with you. No doubt. And what about you, Art? So if I were – I think the advice that he just gave was perfect about going out and seeing it and experiencing it yourself – and also, if somebody's in a mind to try and make the world a better place, um, we've had a real, uh, you know, a real focus um, on non-liberal arts educations in the past, say, 10, 15 years. And we're starting to pay the price. We're starting to have people who, who graduated and have a, um, have a lack of critical thinking skills, a lack of communication right. ability. And uh, you know, you and Monet were covering that earlier, and I think uh, critical thinking pe- uh, businesses are starting to reach out for liberal arts degrees because they're starting to find out what life is like when you're um, when the graduates you're hired don't have those abilities. 
And what would you add to that, Monet? 